Welcome to the Produce Moms Podcast, where we believe there is a produce mom in all of us. I'm Lori Taylor, founder and CEO of the Produce Moms. For 10 years, I sold fresh produce to over 300 grocery stores in the U.S. And today, my team and I are fully focused on inspiring people to eat more fruits and vegetables. This show is just one of the ways that we hope to inspire you and your family to eat more produce and live a better life. If you like what you're hearing on the podcast, join our community of almost 40,000 in all 50 states and over 30 countries by visiting theproducemoms.com slash subscribe. And be sure to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks for being here. Enjoy today's show. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Produce Moms Podcast. My name is Lori Taylor. As always, it's a true blessing to be here as the host and as the founder of the Produce Moms. And today's episode is perfect. Uh, It's all about USA Pears. And if you've been following along with what we do, you know that we are real big fans of Pears and we have a wonderful partnership with USA Pears and we have for many years. So uh, it's truly one of my very favorite fruits. It's my husband's absolute favorite fruit. We buy a ton of pears. I know we're not the only household that does. And today's episode is we're going to welcome one of my colleagues and a a dear friend in the marketing community from USA Pears, Mr. Neil Ferguson. And we are also welcoming a fourth generation pear grower. She is based out of Dryden, Washington, Pacific Northwest in the house. We're welcoming Erica Bland. So Neil, Erica, welcome to the show. Neil, we'll start with you on the intros. Thanks. Uh, Yeah, my name is Neil Ferguson. I'm the creative marketing manager at USA Pairs. With that job, I get to do all the fun stuff. So I I do our social media channels, um, a lot of our creative content. I manage our website. Um, anything we do with influencers, press releases, our digital ad strategy, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And so also, Neil has the lovely job of working with the produce moms. That's but... right. <laughs> Forgot to mention that. Yeah. No, it's all right, Neil. I'm just razzing you a little. Um, no, it, and truly, folks, usapairs.org, anything and everything you want to know about pears, get inspired, add more pears to your family's uh, diet. You're, It's a great superfood. So uh, Erica, please introduce yourself to our listeners. Hi, thanks for having me. As Lori said, my name's Erica Blant, and I'm the fourth generation pear grower here in Dryden, Washington, which is pretty much smack dab in the middle of Washington State. I've spent my whole life working on the orchard, and I've been full-time helping run my family's farm for the last nine years, and I've picked up my own lease orchards for the past four years. And then I'm also a member of the board of directors at our warehouse. That's great. That's great. And you know, you can follow along with Erica's day to day on Instagram, which is so fun. Uh, it's her username is E underscore bland. So more on that later, but, uh, let's, let's kick this off talking about, I did a shout out to the Pacific Northwest, uh, Neil, what makes the Pacific Northwest a great region for growing pears? Yeah, it's interesting. There's, it's, uh, between Oregon and Washington, there's this kind of region that sort of, I would say, kind of goes down the middle of those two states. And, you know, to the west, you it's far too wet to grow pears. And then to the east, it's far too dry. So there's this kind of sweet spot right in the middle of the two states. Um, and if you look at the four growing regions on a map, you'll see that they're all kind of aligned along this sort of middle area um in that area you know there's really rich volcanic soil um there's cool nights and warm days and not too much rain and pears just love this environment it's it's pretty much as optimal as you can get for a pear growing environment um in, especially in in the united states Right. And, and when shoppers see that USA pears logo on their pears that they can know that those pears were grown in which States, Neil. 
Okay, perfect. And Erica, you you said you're right smack dab in the middle of Washington and Dryden, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so Erica, walk our listeners through the typical crop cycle. Like what is a day, what's a day in your life look like? And maybe more importantly, what's a year of your life look like, you know, as, as a pear grower? Well, to limit our time, since we don't have three (laughs) hours of explanation, um, it's definitely a broad question, but I will hit some of the high points along the way. Um, We start with, we start our crop cycle in the fall. You get your leaf analysis in the summer, and then you're ready to put fertilizer on in the fall as soon as your harvest is over. Um, So you harvest in the fall. What, when approximately does the harvest take place? It changes every year for the three varieties that we grow. We start about, um, well, it's getting earlier every year, but the first part of August and can go clear into the end of September. And that's just for our three varieties. Uh, Some is extended out depending on their crop size and variety. And what three varieties do do you and your family grow? We have Bartlett's, D'Angelo's, and Golden Russet Bosque. Got it. Okay. So keep going. Tell us the whole, I want to know, I want to know the, the life's the, you know, the, the cycle of growing a pear. Well, the when it's very important. We start, um, in the winter because as soon as the leaves fall off, you got to start winter pruning because it's important that the trees around here go dormant. And I think that's what makes this a really good growing area because it's cooler temperatures at night. It can be warm, sunny days, they need to go dormant to create more flowers and good fruiting wood the following year. So pruning as much as I don't like cold weather, it is the most important job that you can create to make the best fruit possible the following year. Yeah. And I think that's uh, so important for everyone listening today to understand when harvest ends, the farmer's job does not end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you get that a lot going, oh, well, what are you going to do all winter? I'm like, yeah, well, what are you doing in the off season? Well, I'm, I'm going to run the chainsaw and <laughs> yeah. I'm going to winter prune and some days are miserable cold and then the bright sunny days are incredible. But yeah, it's one of the most important things that you can do to create good fruit the following year. Yeah, and you're mentioning pruning a lot of people won't know the answer to this question. Are, are pears grown on a tree, grown on a bush, grown in the field? Like, how are they grown? Tree. We like to create a three to four liter tree because there's definitely different growing styles of single liter. I mean, you can get down into the works of that, but we try to create a three to four liter tree, which is the big limbs that come out of the stump. Got it. And so how old are some of the trees in your orchards? We actually have one that we call the Grandpa Bartlett because being the fourth generation, it was there right. well before me. And for the most part, we do try to take some of the older trees out when they get too stressed or they stop uh, producing good quality fruit. But that one can pick a full bin. It grows good every year. It's, I mean, I can't, I can barely get my arms around the tree trunk. Wow. And so, I mean, that's well over 32 years old there. Wow. So they range from newly planted one, two year old trees to 30, 30 year old trees. Yeah. And you know, it's like some of the, some of the tree fruit that's grown in the Pacific Northwest, like apples, for instance, the trees, it's like they need the third leaf before they actually start producing fruit that the farmer is going to send to, you know, consumers households. So what, what does that cycle look like in pairs? Do you guys, is it, is it first leaf fruit is good for market or how does that work? Well, it kind of depends. I mean, you get early bloom in the spring for pears. And so we are prone to get frost damage. Uh, So we have to run wind machines to circulate that cool air out of here and keep our fruit from getting damaged because you can mark your fruit right off the bat. And Mm -hmm. that's, not a good way to start the growing year, but accidents happen and mother nature is not always friendly and, um, you know, wind machines and things break down, but, uh, and not, so not all your blooms will turn into fruit. You can have a full bloom and go, man, you know, we should get some good quality on here and 
Only yeah. half of them, you know, only half is, of them make it. <laughs> this is why I say farmers are the ultimate risk takers. Like every oh, single day you're gambling. gambling. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because I'm not a gambler, but then when I yeah. think about it, I'm like, dang, my job is gambling all day long. Every- yeah. You oh, make, you absolutely. make Vegas look like a bunch of crybabies. I mean, it's <laughs> like, <laughs> I know. And I cry if I lose like 10 bucks. <laughs> No, it's amazing. Okay. So how long does it take when, when you have the bloom to the fruit, how long is that? So from the moment it blooms to the moment your, your fruit is, you know, how long does it need to grow? I guess is my question. It can be harvested out to like 90 days from that full bloom mark is kind of our estimate of when an estimated pick date will happen. So about three months on the tree then. Yes. And so Bartlett's, we start as soon as they get uh, a a little bit, probably, I guess, bigger than like a silver dollar Mm -hmm. where you can easily flip them off the tree. We start thinning. And for Bartlett's, it's important to, we thin pretty heavy and we try to keep them 10 to 12 inches apart Mm -hmm. so we can grow big fruit and and not leave them in masses. Cause you get little grapes if you leave them all clumped together. Cause you could have one bloom and you got, you know, five pears connected to it. They sure. will never get big enough. None of them will get big enough. They won't get enough, um, sun, you know, they'll block the sun, they'll block, Correct. uh, and, and the branch will get too heavy. Right. Oh yeah. And yeah. then as soon as your branch breaks and it either falls, you're, you're done. You and, lose them all. Yeah. Yep. So when you thin that fruit, uh, you know, I'm a mom and I felt like, you know, when I was, when my kids were growing up doing the, you know, my children are now 10 and 13, but when, uh, they were babies, those pouch baby foods were starting to really become a big thing. And now they're, you know, like it's pretty much <laughs> what's the category has shifted to, but I remember pears were a huge part of my children's first foods. Um, even when I would buy blends, there was oftentimes like a blend of baby food, you know, it was oftentimes pears were part of that. Um, and, and, you know, it makes sense now that I know more about pears. They're right. a great <laughs> source of fiber and, you know, they're, you know, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful fruit, very nutrient dense. But, um, I, I'm curious when you say you, uh, thin out the trees, is that like the smaller fruit that is not going to grow to maturation and, and for retail or food service channel sales, does that smaller fruit, does that go to like the baby food or what do you guys do with that? Depending on what our marketing is selling to at that time. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, they can go to school lunches. They can go, uh, we do have juicers. We, you know, that don't make size, um, mm-hmm. We really try, that's a point of thinning is to not have so much of that small, lower quality fruit, mm-hmm. but, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of options you have, you have the canning market, you have the, you know, all of those different markets. I just essentially wanted to emphasize to our listeners that it's not like you're thinning out these trees and then you're just dumping that fruit. Like there's a, there is a market for that fruit. There is, when you pick it, yes, there is a market, but when you, a Bartlett's right off the beginning of the year, you're flipping money on the ground because you have to thin out those Bartlett's that aren't edible yet. They're, I mean, they're tiny. Yeah. Okay. And so you are, you are thinning it out and it is a little bit hard when I first started thinning, you're going, Oh my God, I'm putting a lot of money on the ground or that could be. But if you think about it, you need, you need better quality in the fruit to, to try to be able to get the price and make some money and things like that. So you do have to kind of sacrifice some of those. Well, or like you mentioned earlier, you're not going to get the, you're not going to get the grade or the product that you would be able to sell. And so it's like, no one wins if you don't do that step. Um, no, I mean, growers aren't growing (laughs) produce to try to put in, you know, cannery and juicers, you know, you you want to be able to send it to consumers and have good. So, I mean, there's, we're glad that there's markets for that because you just can't create a perfect pair on every limb. And Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just not the realistic. Yeah, you're that's growing your goal, it. But. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's not manufactured as what. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay. So we've got three months of the of the fruit growing on the tree, and within that three months, you're doing all sorts of different things to keep the tree healthy and to help raise the most beautiful pears that people are going to want to buy and take home and and enjoy. Um, so after that three months, then you do what would be called harvest, correct? 
Yes. Okay. So walk us through that process. Like what does harvest look like? And then the, you know, how do you, is it hand labor? Is it machine labor? Like, what is it? It's, it changes every year. So we never know an exact date. We can kind of get an estimate, but sometimes like this year, uh, we were felt, I felt like I was scrambling to be like, Oh man, we got to get bins out. We got to get everything going. Um, and so (laughs) with it never the same, you kind of have an idea, but you need to be ready to rock and roll when the field men come mm-hmm. out and say, Hey, your pressures are this, they need, you need to start picking. And yes. so you want to make sure that you've already reached out to your crew and everything is handpicked. Every pair has to be handpicked. The only equipment that's is tractors and that's hauling the bin of fruit out to the lanes and stacking sure. it for the truck to come pick up. Sure. But yeah. everything is handpicked with, care and I mean our crew's incredible. Yeah, it's amazing. I have had the I've had the privilege of watching a harvest. Um it was in the Yakima area, but it was it's it's amazing. And uh so after they are hand harvested off the trees, put into the bins, the forklift comes into the orchards, gets the bins, puts them on the truck. The truck goes to a warehouse or a packing shed. I've heard interchangeable, you know, terminology for this stage. (laughs) Um, so, (laughs) and so there, um, and this is, this is where I learned when I was at this stage of, of experiencing the harvest myself, this is where I learned that pears don't float. No, (laughs) (laughs) because when you're, if you, you know, you wash the pears and, you know, and they don't float, they stay at the bottom. So you, you have to, um, raise the bin up to drain the water out. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. it's kind of a fun thing to see once it gets to the warehouse and what they, what pairs have to go through to get in the right packages to get sent, right, you know, right. just get sent out to consumers. And this is all happening. All this stuff we're describing folks, this is pretty much happening same day. Like they pick it off the tree, they get it to the warehouse and then they get it and they hand select them for, you know, is it going to go in a bag? Is it going to go in a box? And do they, Erica, do they still wrap the pears in tissue that go into the box? Oh my gosh. Now that is, that is an unbelievable sight. And when I was uh, experiencing and watching that, they, they, you know, they just wanted to make a fool out of me. They were like, Lori, why don't you wrap a few in pairs? <laughs> and did you? They're so fast. <laughs> it's unbelievable. They are so fast. Is there a video of that anywhere? Neil, does USA Paris have footage of that? I mean, it's like they are incredibly fast. They do. I, I, we have captured that before. <laughs> it's unbelievable. So, so Erica, they're they're throwing these pairs and they're hand wrapping them and they look gorgeous in the box. And you know, I've said it many times when we promote pears at the Produce Month. I'm I'm convinced pears are the most elegant fruit. Um, and and even in the packing house, like wrapping it in tissue paper, like oh, it's, yeah. you know, <laughs> like it's a like it's a Christmas present. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> every pear is nicely wrapped and I mean perfectly. Put put in the box and yeah. it's incredible at how fast they are, but how delicate they are at the same time because the you can't, human you can't be rough on it. Oh no, the human element behind each and every pair that makes it to market is really just, uh, it, it's amazing. It's profound. Yeah. Cause pairs, there's not a lot of automation just because the shape of it is not, mm-hmm. we, it's not a perfectly round fruit that can roll across the, you know, it's got these necks and these stems and, you know, you got boss pairs that have a really long neck. And um, so a a lot of it is hand labor from start to finish. Unbelievable. And so then once you get it, you know, once you get them wrapped up like little Christmas presents and the tissue paper and the perfectly pouch, you know, the hand placed pairs in the pouch bags or whatever, I mean, how long is the process then from when it gets to, onto trucks and to to grocery stores. Are we talking a day or two days or what, what usually is the turnaround there from that stage? It's usually a pretty quick turnaround. I know that we can sell them clear into, um, you know, next year because they do store well. And if you keep them nicely wrapped and all that, but it kind of depends on your marketing team and where it's going and Mm -hmm. does it need to be put in a crate and go across the equator? Does it need to be, is it local? Is it, you know, um, there's so many factors involved that I, 
I kind of laugh because I'm like, well, that's a little out of my pay grade because I'm that's just growing why you hire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why you hire your marketing and sales, and that's yeah. why you have all these fantastic people surrounding you. Yeah, but it's a yeah. pretty intense, quick. Process yeah, so it's a super it's quick stressful. process. It's a super <laughs> quick process. Um, farming always is, but, uh, and you know, through this podcast, I hope that our listeners have grown to understand and appreciate how specialty crop farming fruits, vegetables, tree nuts, it's even, you know, it's very, uh, it's very fast paced. It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's super intense, but Erica, you mentioned the crops go across the equator. So the, your fruit that you grow right there in Dryden, Washington is, is literally enjoyed all over like globally or that's amazing. Yeah. And maybe Neil can help with that. Cause I know I, every time I go somewhere I was in, you know, Cayman islands and I always go look for USA pears and I, I get really excited when the bag or the mm. sticker says that. Cause yeah. it doesn't matter if it's my pear, as long as it's USA pears, that's huge for all of us. That's huge for all of us. Yes. And all right. So Erica, anything else you want to tell, t- share with our listeners as it relates to the crop cycle and, and growing pears before we take it over to Neil? Cause I'm definitely going to put him in the hot seat here about where USA <laughs> pears are at. I think <laughs> that it's just really important at how much Uh, we try to show people, but how much that these family farms and I like to say the little guys, you know, that we care so much about it. We care about our crew. We care about our fruit. We care about the consumers and getting a good pair out there. And that, I mean, it's a passion. It's something you pride yourself on and it's worth waking up every day. (laughs) It's peritastic. Um, um, all right, Neil, thank you, Erica, for sharing that. And Neil, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the marketing and of USA pairs. So let's start with, um, the distribution footprint, if you don't mind. Yeah. So pairs grown in Oregon and Washington make up about 87% of the U S fresh pear supply. Uh, so you could find you could find USA pears, uh, a handful of our varieties in pretty much every grocery store in the U.S. Yeah. And then our biggest export markets are Canada and Mexico. Mm-hmm. And beyond that, uh, we some will make it to South America, and some will be exported to Southeast Asia, um, China, depending on the year, and India, and then. I think that about covers it. Um, that's uh, that's unbelievable, Neil. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all around, all around the world. Yeah, uh, out of two states. Pairs. That's that's <laughs> unbelievable. Um, and I hope that helps folks understand the magnitude of the farming operations that we're talking about, and how cool that so many of the folks growing. USA pears are their stories very similar to Erica where they're fourth generation family pear pear growers you know I mean it's just it's great so Neil um Erica mentioned her family does Bartlett's Dianjus and Boss let's like explain what other varieties are are grown in under the USA pears brand yeah so there's 10 varieties that are grown commercially and available in the markets, uh, you know, obviously that fluctuates uh, depending on the time of year. Some varieties are, there's a lot smaller of a crop than others. So, uh, but yeah, the main varieties, and I'll probably repeat some that Erica said, but uh, Green Anjou, Red Anjou, Comice, Bartlett, Red Bartlett, Star Crimson, Bosque, Concord, Seckle, and Pharrell. So a lot of those are not household names, but uh, depending on the time of year, and and I'd say right now, up until about January or so, you can get all 10 of these, uh, depending on where you shop in the U.S. And and each flavor is completely unique, different. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth trying all. It's worth trying all. And I have to also (laughs) call out that USA Pairs has a wine, cheese, and pear pairing guide. Um, So. (laughs) <laughs> so try them all at a glass of wine, a little bit of cheese. Um, okay. So Absolutely. Neil, we got to set the record straight because I might've even mispronounced it when I was recalling it. The Anjou pears, they have the D apostrophe Anjou is the D silent. Let's set the record straight right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I might get into it with Erica on this one, but <laughs> no, it's funny enough. Um, and it, you know, it's kind of even ranges. Sometimes it's even different on the stickers that it's on the produce. So you will see everything. Uh, Dianju is pretty common. Uh, we say Anju or uh, depending on where you are, you might hear Anju. That would be me. So, <laughs> um, I've, I've heard it in Indiana like that. Yeah. <laughs> So it's kind of up to interpretation. Um, I often say Anju, but uh, it it's sort of just depends who you ask. Right, right. <laughs> I think the biggest takeaway here, folks, is no matter how you say it, just recognize the fact that USA Pears has 10 different varieties of delicious and unique pears that you all need to try. Okay, so... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, thank you, Neil. Um, so Erica, tell us, you know, top, top, cons- one of the top consumer inquiries that we get, and it's really kind of emerged as a content pillar for us here on the podcast. And that is the topic of sustainability. So we know that we know sustainably produced food is more and more important to consumers. How is your family farm prioritizing sustainability? I don't, it's not only the farms that are trying to, you know, I mean, we're trying to supply consumers with the best possible pair, the perfect looking pair, the stem. I mean, the whole, the whole thing, the whole big picture of it, you know, in our warehouse sales team, they work hard every day to make sure that pairs are packed, stored properly to get to the consumers on time. Does it have time to ripen? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of misconceptions sometimes on pairs is the, patience it takes to sometimes ripen it once you buy it. It's not necessarily one that you can take out of the store and eat that same day. Yes, we're in the big picture trying to work on that as well, but you also can't send soft fruit places. And so it's something that you battle every year and you, you just try to you try to do the best you can and you work with your warehouse and it's, yeah, I love what you're saying here because I actually just spoke at a sustainability summit that our industry had. And I said in my remarks, I said, look, really taste and eating experience is a huge part of sustainability. Yes. So I love that. I mean, you can answer that question in so many ways. Sustainability is this huge umbrella term. And I love that your perspective is in line with like, we are being sustainable by making sure that we produce day in and day out the the highest quality fruit possible. Yes. And it, I mean, it's different every year and it's something that you strive for. And that's, that's the end goal is you want someone to bite into that and going, Oh my gosh, I love it. There's juice on my face. It's sticky. I, you right. know, that's what right. you want. And you work for that day in and day out year round. Mm-hmm. No, it's great. And so, uh, Neely and Erica, both for these, you know, last couple remarks here, um, Let's, let's make sure that people understand the journey when they purchase fresh pears at home, or I'm sorry, when they purchase fresh pears at the grocery store, usually folks, that pear on the grocery store shelf usually is not ripe and ready to eat. Um, you know that your pears are ripe and ready to eat when you do what we call check the neck and you, with your thumb, apply a slight amount of pressure to the neck of the pear. That's the taller, that's the part closest to the stem. It's usually skinnier. So apply a gentle amount of pressure with your thumb. And if the fruit yields to slight pressure, that's when you know that it is ready to eat. Um, so Neil, I'll, I'll have you, um, you know, add any remarks that you want to that. Cause truthfully, USA pears is who taught me that. But <laughs> Um, so is there anything else that you want consumers to understand about the journey, maybe where they should be storing their pears once they bring them home? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, pears can be sometimes depending on where you shop, you can get ripe and ready to eat pears. And we're definitely focused on uh, bringing that to more retailers. Great. Pears are also compared to say an apple. They're they're They've always been a fruit about that takes a little bit of patience. And I think, that's actually kind of what makes them so special is, you know, it takes a little bit of waiting, but when you get it to that perfect sweet spot, it's just the, it's an eating experience, unlike any other piece of produce out there. Mm -hmm. We say, you know, bring pears home from the grocery store, leave them out. The best thing to do is just leave them in a fruit bowl, uh, room temperature. 
Sometimes it could take uh, three to five days or so. Okay. And can I just say that's like the most gorgeous centerpiece right there, folks. You do. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Especially at fall time. (laughs) Yes. Agreed. Okay. Carry on, Neil. Sorry. (laughs) That's why you see pears showing up in so many paintings, you know, dating back centuries. It's just, uh, it's a beautiful fruit and it'll, it'll really tie the room together. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, we say leave them at room temp uh, a few days just kind of check the neck each day. Once they do ripen, if you're not ready to eat all of them right at that moment, then we suggest putting ripe pears into the refrigerator and that'll make them last another five days or so. And really, so, you know, depending on when you buy them, pears are actually a very, they're a long lasting produce item, which is great uh, pretty much any time of year. Bingo. You know what? When my husband, when we got the shelter in place orders and I sent my husband on the Costco haul to get like three weeks worth of food, <laughs> I said, stock up on pears because the last. <laughs> and so <laughs> he came home with like three of those big Costco size bags. But uh... <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you really want to stretch it, you know, you could take, you can make pear jam, you can do canning with pears. I mean, that mm-hmm. is to make, ensure that you have pear goodness year round. So, uh, yeah. Definitely. No, there's super, super versatile fruit. I mean, and, and really, I know I've already spoke on how I feel they're so elegant, but they're also so approachable. Like you can just eat them out of hand and they're very affordable. And, um, I also love that you can make them sweet or you can make them savory and they're perfect for everything from kids, lunch boxes to elegant cocktail party, charcuterie boards. I mean, it's just the versatility of this fruit is one of the reasons I love it so much. Yeah. Yeah. So Erica, tell us your favorite way to enjoy pears. I mean, you're the grower and you've been living and you grew up in a pear family. It's a huge part of your family culture. Tell us one of your favorite recipes or your favorite way to enjoy them. Actually the family pear pie recipe. I'm not a huge fruit pie fan, but man, I will eat a whole pear pie. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) my, My mom, makes it from her aunt Ada that had the recipe and it's no family secret. I mean, you can reach out on Instagram. I'll tell you what it is because even one of my uh, good girlfriends, she texted me and we actually had made mini pear pies. I got married three weeks ago. And so my mom and sister Mm -hmm. made mini pear pies for the wedding. And, uh, she was like, I need your recipe because I'm taking pear pie to Thanksgiving this year. And so, Oh, wow. Okay. So yes, everyone reach out to Erica on Instagram. E underscore bland is her username. <laughs> it's to die for. You'll want it. Trust me. All right, I'm sending you a message as soon as the broadcast ends. <laughs> okay. Uh, Neil, what about you? I mean, you've spent the last three years of your career as one of the marketing leads for this amazing fruit representing USA pears. What you your website has more pear recipes than any other website in the world. Uh, tell us tell us your favorite way to enjoy pears. Yeah, you know, I, I have to say these days, uh, what it's kind of obvious, but also very unexpected, depending on who you ask. But I think pears as a topping on pizza is just like one of the mm. amazing things that a lot of people maybe haven't thought to try, but yet you do see it at a lot of restaurants. And the the cool thing is like, it's just, there's so many possibilities. You know, I've seen the kind of a classic is like pear and prosciutto. um, And then there's like pear gorgonzola, walnut pizza. Oh my gosh. Yes. That sounds amazing. We've seen lately just tons of different people get super creative, you know, people using kind of alternative meat products and as pepperoni and sausage and, just uh, you can kind of do whatever and it's the sweetness doesn't overwhelm. So it's um, it's I've really never seen somebody have like a bad encounter with a pear pizza. So I, I push for that. I'm all about it. And I, I think pears are just like make a great topping. That is awesome. Too, yeah, uh, great inspiration there. Oh my goodness. What an amazing, I'm hungry. I know me too. I, we're wrapping up the show so I can go eat a pear, but, uh, (laughs) but no, in all seriousness, both of you, thank you. I 
truly enjoyed this episode. I had so much fun with our conversation. Erica, I learned so much about the on the farm operation and all those details that you shared. And Neil, just thank you for your knowledge. I had no idea that USA Pairs went all around the globe like that. So really, I have so much pride in what this episode represents. And I want to thank you both. Um, But we have, you know, the tradition on the show where you both get the final word. I'd like to remind everyone, Erica's on Instagram. We've said her handle a few times. I'll go ahead and say it again, E underscore bland. And USA Pairs website, I am not... I am not exaggerating when I say it has more pear recipes than any other website in the world. USAPears.org. It is going to inspire you in ways you never knew you could be inspired about this great fruit. So, uh, Neil, why don't you say goodbye um, first? And then, Erica, I'd love for you to actually sign us off from today's show. So, Neil? Yeah, thanks, Lori. I, the only thing I would say is just, you know, we hear from people all the time that pears are underrated and you know, they don't get enough attention. And that's what I get to be passionate about. And what we all work towards is putting pears in the spotlight. I think they're uh, one of the most delicious, nutritious fruits out there. And, you know, once people kind of discover the the perfect ripe pear, it's like you've, you've stumbled on something great. You know, you, you, you're enlightened with the flavor of it. So it's all about like having that perfect eating experience. And that's what we focus on. I just want to thank you both for having me. This has been enjoyable and I love what I do and I'm proud to be a part of it in the family. I'm, I'm proud to keep representing the Valley USA pairs and all of that. And I just, I just want everybody to know how compassionate farmers are and what they do every day to try to get the best product to you and to go enjoy pears every way possible. Pizza, cheese and wine, whatever it may be, they're phenomenal. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Produce Moms podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a featured guest, just send an email to lori at theproducemoms.com. We know there is a produce mom in you because there's a produce mom in all of us. Join our community on Facebook and all social platforms. Help us change the way America eats. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.